Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome again. My name is Tsui Fen, a student from the Faculty of Arts and Social Science. Thank you for being a part of your life today. Our program today will be split up into three sections. The first will be a 10-minute talk by our speaker, Mr. Tan Chuan Jin, followed by a 10-minute interview by Mr. Viswa Sadasivan, the chairman of the You Alive Organizing Committee. Lastly, we will be having a 40-minute Q&A session. So if you wish to ask a question, do kindly proceed to the microphones located along the side, speak into them directly and introduce yourself. This is important so that the online community is able to hear your question clearly. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Without further ado, let us begin. One of the things that affects a lot of people, and certainly for myself, isn't the engagement part. It's a lack of engagement, a disengagement. Uh, and you, you learn from a negative perspective how it feels like to be disengaged, to be made to feel really, really irrelevant. And it, it causes you to just switch off. And that's, that's where apathy starts to set in. I think deep down inside all of us, we do want to be part of something bigger. We want to feel that we matter. We want to feel that uh, we can contribute and make a difference. And I guess it's really about providing opportunities and platforms to connect so that people can play a part, uh, big or small. I think there's a rising awareness and preparedness to step forward. But increasingly, I suppose, with people being involved, a lot more information being available, um, there will be invariably the tensions, and we see it today. Um, certainly it's not new, I think the tensions have always been there, but platforms for these tensions to surface and become much more obvious uh, is certainly very different from before, which presents a challenge. I think not just for government, but I think for civil society, people as a whole. How do we interact on those platforms? How do we discuss? How do we disagree? But I think it's, it's good that you have that. It sharpens your thinking and, and I strongly believe that it's the way we disagree, even when we disagree with each other, the way we do that, actually really, that's where it really defines us as people as well. Because ultimately we can't be going on forever talking back and forth, um, so you need to make, make bold, sometimes difficult decisions. Part of leadership is to be to have the courage to make those calls. And that's what leadership is about, and I think that's what people expect and look towards as well. Not just decisions, but as far as possible, a vision, ideas, uh, which they can rally around. Or, you know, uh, even if they don't fully agree with it, but there's a sense of trust that well, perhaps they have listened to me, they've taken on board my inputs, and that while well, I don't like the final outcome necessarily, but well, let's let's go with it. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tan Chuan Jin. A very good evening to everyone. Um, I've been told that I cannot wander between, between the chairs and the light and can't wander be beyond that because there's a camera for the web streaming. Uh, well, I mean, this evening, I think essentially I've been asked to come here to I think, share with you some perspectives. Uh, we were discussing the different topics that we could talk about, and I think the topic of engagement came up. And perhaps what I'll do is I'll just take this um, couple of minutes to share with you some perspectives. I think essentially three points on how I relate to this issue of engagement. I think firstly, perhaps the good way to start off about engagement is to talk about disengagement. Um, I think a lot of us, and to, to be honest, engagement isn't really a new, it's not a new idea. I think all of us are familiar with it. And I would suggest that a lot of us are familiar with it 
from the perspective of being disengaged. I think if you were to imagine and remember the moments, whether in school, uh, whether at work, uh, with colleagues, with bosses, you will remember moments, I think, where you felt particularly cheesed off by events. That you were completely disengaged by the way people talked to you, by the way you were treated, and so on. I think many of you would have experienced um, perhaps staffing a paper, writing a paper, sending it up, and then coming back, and then it mangled you know, in, in, into pieces. Not necessarily improving the quality of it, but you feel that you know, your piece of work, and you put in a lot of time uh, into that, wasn't quite respected. Um, or attending meetings, and you spend one week preparing all your PowerPoint slides and all the height slides and everything, and then you turn up for the meeting, and then they just give you like one minute, and that's it. I mean, I think many of us have been there before. And it's a very deflating experience. Because somehow we felt that we put in a lot of effort, we, we meant well, we had a lot of ideas we wanted to share, we wanted to put it across, but somehow or other, it was disregarded. Perhaps there were good reasons why, you know, perhaps there wasn't enough time, but I think we feel it. So I think it's very useful for us to actually remember those moments of disengagement. Because I think we all have experienced it in different shape and form, but I think it's important for us to relate it to how, what we learn from it and how we engage people in turn. Or more importantly, how we make sure that we don't disengage people in turn. So engagement is really about, I think from a leadership perspective, it's, it's really about how we connect with people. Leadership is very much a social activity. It's, it's really an activity that takes place between people. It's a relationship that's established, right? So, and the key thing about leadership, and many of you are leaders in your own right, in your student body group, uh, in the faculties and so on, being in charge of your uh, whatever groups that you are, you're in charge of in school or at work. But at the heart of it all is, are people prepared to follow you? Because that's what leadership is about. You set in place ideas, perspectives, are you prepared to follow the person? And the key word, if I were to distill everything down to one word, is it's about trust. Do you trust the person? And engagement, I think, is a process where we try to engage, where we try to connect with people on an intellectual level. I think we try to connect people on an emotive level as well, on a social level. In whatever shape and form, I think many of us will have different approaches, we have different personalities, but it's how we eventually engage and connect with people. And in the process, do we earn the trust of the people whom we work with, as colleagues, as bosses, and so on. Because at the heart of it, are people prepared to follow you? They may not agree with you, they may not even necessarily like you, but do they respect you? Do they trust you? And I think engagement is really the process by which you engender trust. How do you connect with people? So there are many different ways you can do it, there are different techniques, and so on and so forth, but I think what is key to it is, from the recipient end, does the person feel that you're really trying to respect his space, you're trying to respect his views? Are you sincerely reaching out to listen? Are you trying to, uh, sincerely reaching out to engage and talk to someone? I think that really is at the heart of everything in terms of engagement. And so engagement isn't new. I think all of us have experienced it in various shape and form. We have all um, exercised it in different ways. I would suggest that even government in many ways uh, tries to engage in different shapes and form or disengage as the case may be. So that's the first point. I think it's not unique, it's not new. I think it's something that we're all familiar with. But we all talk about it, but importantly is what do we in turn, how do we treat people in our own respective uh, response, in our respective spaces? Uh, whether as a subordinate, whether as a colleague, whether as a boss, what do we then do to engage people? So we can comment on how people are disengaging, we can comment about the lack of engagement, but often we ourselves, we are part of that process as well. A second point I thought I would like to share is to look at it from the perspective of the individual. Uh, all of us, what do we feel? And how, how do we look at issues like that? I think all of us are individuals. I think we all feel that we ought to matter, that we want to be part of a process. I think we can talk about the Gen X, the Gen Y, the Gen Z, the difference in the different generations. But I think all of us want to be part of something. I think we may be inward looking, we may be self-absorbed, but I think deep down inside all of us, we want to be part of something meaningful, we want to be part of something bigger, and we want to be able to shape the world around us. Whether big things or small things, I think we want to feel that we are not just a digit. We are an individual, because all of us are. And how do we, in turn, play a role, big or small, in the space that we operate in? So that is where, that's how individuals look at themselves. We don't like to be treat, treated as digits. We don't like to be treated in a functional way. Uh, we don't like to be treated in a very transactional fashion, which I think so, I would suggest that sometimes communication, certainly in, from a government perspective, 
Um, if you whittle it down to just a GDP growth, or the, you talk about the economy, you talk about education, about how important it is for us to be productive and then contribute to the economy. We understand that, but at the same time, we don't like to feel that we are just a cog in the, in the whole machinery. And I think that's human nature. And I think it's important to look at it from this perspective because that's how all of us feel. And I think it's instructive to think about it because it's what climate you want to construct in the place that you work in, or even at a, as an, at a national level, what's the climate that you want to establish so that people are able to play a part? What platforms do you provide so that in various shape and form we can share our perspectives, play a big role, small role, our views are heard and we feel that we matter. I would suggest that in the workplace it's the same thing. Do you create a climate where even young officers, young staffers, as they surface up their ideas, they are given a time of day to add their views? Do they see the efforts are being translated into policy? Do you then close the loop to recognize their work? Little things like that, I think, matter a lot. I think at an individual level. And I think we all know that. And at the same time, I think when we think about it from that perspective, and you look at it from the perspective of engaging others and to make sure that people are not disengaged, I think you begin to gain, gain some insights. And we suggest that in many ways, at the governance level as well, I think that's something that we need to learn and we need to understand as well. And the last point perhaps I will close off with really is to talk about what does it mean, therefore, in terms of what we do. I think from a, certainly from a government perspective, and this is something that I believe quite strongly in, uh, it's something that I've been doing uh, even from my time in the Army, is how do we actually provide platforms for people to participate and to play a role. There will be times when you need to decide. And I think as leaders, you need to have the courage and you need to be decisive and you need to make those decisions. But there are times when you don't need to make the decision quite so urgently, and you have time. So what do you use that time to do? How do you create that space for people to be involved? How do you involve the public in the different things that we do? And I think going forward, we need to do that more. Uh, it's going to be messy, because what it means is that you'll be getting more people on board, more views will have to be heard. From the policy-making perspective, it's going to take longer. There'll be a lot more toing and froing. But I think it's helpful because, one, you, level, you leverage on the collective wisdom of the people at large out there, the different views. I think it makes your policy a lot sharper, a lot more relevant, because I think you can't be just stuck in your ivory tower. You need to make sure that the views out there matter. And, the, and there's a very different environment out there today because there's a lot more information. The people are a lot more educated, a lot more informed, and I think the views ought to be brought on board. So in my capacity, for example, in Ministry of Manpower, I think we have different focus groups, uh, town hall, we have uh, focused dialogues where we bring different stakeholders on board to discuss issues, for example, even with the Employment Act, uh, the issues regarding foreign workers, foreign domestic workers. Same with MND, even development efforts with the rail corridor and so on. You provide platforms for different people to be involved at different stages. Sometimes it's online, sometimes it's via the social media, sometimes it's via focused discussions. I think there are many different ways we can do that. But I would suggest that I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all uh, approach. I think there are many different formats that we can use. There are very different approaches that we can take. Some issues you can probably have a lot more discussion. Some issues, perhaps because of the sensitivity of it, it will, be have, it will have to be done differently. And I think increasingly we need to do that. Uh, we need to carry on that conversation and engagement and that, that, that form. And I think that's something that the government needs to learn. I think not just at the political level, I think even at the civil service level, we need to understand how do we then bring that on board as part of the policy making process. And that's something I think we will see more of that happening. Uh, different ministries will operate in different ways because the topics are different, the issues are different, different stakeholders, so the dynamics are very different. So essentially, we all recognise that I think we all have to play a part. And I think that's for the better of Singapore. Uh, like I said, it makes it more difficult. Certainly, uh, there's a lot of tensions involved. There will be disagreements. Uh, it can get very emotive. I've been doing a lot of different work with different groups, and I'll tell you that it's um, not easy. But I think it's, it's probably good all around. Firstly, to learn. I think secondly, I think to sharpen, I think our own thinking issues, uh, to bounce it off others. And eventually, you need to find a common space to go forward. And that really, I think, is quite key. Uh, I don't think we will ever reach a stage where everybody shares a common perspective and therefore reach an agreement. There'll be some topics that will happen that way. But I think on many issues, we will have to find areas where we have to agree to disagree. There'll be areas that we we'll agree on, but find those common space to move forward. And I will suggest that maybe at the end of it, really, engagement is two ways. I think one is how do we, from a leadership perspective, and I suggest not just at the political level, at the government level, but certainly on your individual perspective level as you as leaders, how do you engage? 
but for the recipients and then as citizens as well, how do we also respond in turn? Because engagement is really two ways. So one is how do we provide the climate, how do we provide the platforms, but a key part really is how do we then respond in turn and play a part in the process. And I think we are probably better for it, but like I said, it's, um, I don't think it's new. I think we've always been doing it in some shape and form, but I think going forward, a lot more of that has got to be done. And I think a lot more different platforms uh, will have to be developed in order for that engagement to take place. So perhaps I'll end there. I think the main thing really is to say that I think engagement is something that's actually quite important. I don't think you can go through motion um, because frankly, I don't think you can do that because it involves people, involves face-to-face -face interaction, and it really, at the end of it, is to find common consensus where we can, find a common space where we can, to find areas that we can agree to disagree on, but ultimately, I think, as leaders in, in our own respective rights in, in at whatever level, the engagement process is really important because it establishes a relationship and establishes trust. Because without trust, I think there cannot be leadership, leadership cannot be effective in any shape and form, and that applies to government as well. And I think when we lose the trust of the people at large and lose the respect and the confidence, I think it affects the effectiveness of government. So I think it's inevitable that all of us need to play a part. And certainly, as a political office holder, it's something that we need to do and we need to do better. And we need to put in a lot more effort to make sure that we engage better with all of you. And I would suggest in turn, I think, for civil society and people at large to also engage back and let's see how that develops over time. So maybe with that, I'll just end there and I'll invite Viswa to join me on stage. Thank you very much. Thanks, Minister, for joining us. Okay, let's cut to the chase. Do you think the ground is cynical? Do I think the ground is cynical? Hmm. About? About you, about the government. Are you all cynical? <laughs> well, I, I think the ground is, um, there will be different perspectives out there. I'm sure some of you out here as well, you will be cynical. Um, before coming into the government, I also will have my views and issues and perspectives, and I will say that I was cynical as well, to some degree. Maybe not with everything, but I think we all do, we all have a certain degree of cynicism, because a lot of views are out there. Um, we all will be wondering, you know, is this another fad, or is this just one of those things that they're just going through, you know, the big Wayang show, um, are just going through this because they have to, there's no choice. Um, so I think those are legitimate concerns, um, legitimate perspectives, because one is a function of our experience over time, right? Did we experience it before, and then now suddenly why this, if it's a new thing? Or, and, we, and at the end of it, like I said, do we trust, say in, in this sense, the government enough, or the leaders, that are they, do they mean what they say? Are they really trying to reach out, or is it just going through the process? Um, and I think there's a legitimate concern that some will have, but. I think we just need to participate in the process and I think individuals have to decide whether they sufficiently trust the process or not. Um, but it's something I'm, I'm fully aware that there will be that level of cynicism out there in society. I, I would put it to you that there's a significant level of cynicism at this point in time on the ground, even <coughs> pertaining to the national conversation. Yeah. Uh, now, is it necessarily a bad thing? Because as they say, it's better to get a reaction than have no no sense of a response. Oh, I would agree. I think I would be more worried if there's no response. It was just deafening yeah. silence yeah. or apathy. I think that's even worse. Yeah. I think cynicism happens, and I think there's a response, even if it's visceral, indicates that you bother enough. To, you, you bother enough to think about the issue. Uh, you care enough to actually read up about it uh, and have a perspective. Uh, and I think that's really quite important because I think the moment we stop caring and stop bothering, I think that's actually probably not very constructive for society as a whole. So I think the pushback, I think it's, it's something that has happened. And I, I would suggest it's not new. I think it's been growing over the years in different shape and form. You know, uh, we have different issues that we have. Our, we have pet peeves over different issues, uh, different events, even trigger points that will cause us that level of angst. And if it's unaddressed, it continues to fester. Um, but I think it's better that we have that reaction yeah. and then engage, at least talk, and then look at it from our perspective and I'll try to look at it from your perspective. And I think importantly in the conversation really is about, not just about listening to what the government has to say and what the people, has, actually to listen to each other and realize that there actually there's a multitude of voices out there. So, the, I guess if you examine the reasons for the cynicism, it could be because, it, it could be uh, a result of decades of feeling disenfranchised, feeling disengaged, 
perhaps decades of depoliticization, right? So now, perhaps the reason why you're getting a reaction is because the ground is actually getting engaged. Isn't it? The ground I is actually getting engaged, except that the way they're engaging you is not necessarily always palatable to you. It's but they're engaging you. Uh, it's not the most comfortable experience, yeah. I would say. And I know. I mean, um, do you want to share I, with us your, your painful Bukit Brown experience? <laughs> Actually, actually what, what did you learn from that experience? Actually, I'm, I'm quite glad it happened in many ways. I think it was an eye-opening experience. I mean, in my own capacity, certainly, like I said, um, in the way I led and managed, um, certainly in the army, I think the, I felt it was, I, I always, I've always felt that it was very important, I think, to build teams, uh, certainly in terms of establishing the right climate and to leverage on really the perspectives that are out there uh, in the, with the people I, I work with. Um, I think... That same approach, I think, applies really in terms of uh, policy making as well. And certainly in terms of the public policy space, there are a lot of issues which I think we should try to engage. And certainly in my both capacities in MND and MOM, I've tried to explore how best we could do that. Um, Bukit Brown was interesting. I mean, it's one of those things where um, I think a decision had been taken. Um, and do, that we'll have different views about whether the decision is the right one, about building that road uh, across Bukit Brown. So that's something when we came on board, a decision of that was taken. Well, in fact, one of the very first things I wanted to understand about MND is really, I mean, must, must we really you know, build that road? Because I've been going to Bukit Brown long before it became a hip issue, right? I live very near Bidadari as well, and I lament, I kind of lament the loss of all the, uh, the old cemetery that was there. So I do care a lot about it. In fact, I feel very strongly that I'm a bit um, disappointed and I wish that more people would actually <coughs> bother a lot more about the issue and would actually visit there a lot more and really try to understand the issues behind uh, not the issues about behind Bukit Brown, but the history that's embedded within that space. Um, but unfortunately, I've, I have to also wear the other hat of trying to balance the development aspect. So I think with Bukit Brown, I think we, I try to reach out to different groups. Certainly, um, we reach out to uh, Heritage Society, for example, which we felt, I felt that we didn't have enough of a developed relationship with them uh, because there will be other development issues. And there are a lot of other areas of history and heritage which I actually feel very strongly that we should um, try to work together to actually further because I think it's important for us to have a sense of place, a sense of history. Um, so we engage different groups, um, and I think over time we try to explain to the different stakeholders who are involved in the focus groups. And I think we also realized that increasingly there were also online groups growing. Uh, so at some stage, I think, I thought that let's expand it and bring on board some of these different individuals and groups. Uh, I don't know them. I interact with some of them online. Um, but I guess the challenge is that, you know, we have gone through, in, even in Parliament, uh, even through the press, to explain about the road. And really, uh, what I was trying to establish is to explain, again, why that had to happen, why there was uh, not as much consultation as uh, perhaps some would have liked to have, um, but suddenly also focus on what else could we do going forward. Um, but unfortunately, the events turned out rather differently. I think different individuals who came in at different stages had, well, perspectives of their own. Um, Mismatch expectations. Perhaps so. Um, but there were also individuals in some of those groups whom we have been working uh, with for a long time and who I would regard in a way as friends, uh, trusted partners, and who also participated in issuing the statement that they did, which um, was rather disappointing, to put it mildly. But I thought it was a good uh, eye-opening experience because I guess I, I tend to approach things uh, from a quite a straightforward perspective. There's an issue to grapple with. Let's you know, put the cards on the table. Let's really try to find a common space. There'll be areas that we disagree on, certainly, you know, with the different groups on different issues. But um, this just you know, came uh, right back at me and certainly at us. And so that was, I guess, I wouldn't say that was a setback, but that was a, it was a good wake-up call that <clears throat> perhaps we need to be a bit more uh, aware that really um, there are many, many different stakeholders out there with very different perspectives about how things ought to be done, how engagement can take place. Um, but be that as it may, I mean, we continue to work with the stakeholders that we continue to work with. I'm still very interested to figure out how best to create a common space. There are a lot of different things that we can do, and certainly we're funding and supporting some of this effort. Minister, uh, you've heard of the term black hole syndrome, right? You know, there are two problems with engagement that was highlighted, uh, I mean, I've heard before. One is called the black hole syndrome, the other is called the blacklist syndrome. 
The black hole syndrome is a perception that I can tell you a whole lot of things that I think are constructive, but it goes right into the black hole. The blacklist syndrome, I think, is quite obvious. Right? So, do you still do you feel that there is still this black hole syndrome? There's a perception that you will filter only what you would like to hear, regardless of whether the other viewpoints are presented to you, so that you actually feel in the end or convince yourself that you have consensus. You know, consensus can be natural or it can be artificial. And I put, it, I put to you that there's a perception out there that your, the government's obsession with consensus is so overpowering that you actually create consensus. I think that would be a... By, by listening, do you know the radio yeah. ad? You hear only what you yeah, want to hear. Selective listening. Yeah. Or benign Which neglect. I think all of us are guilty of. Yeah. And I would put it to you this way. I think many of you here, you hold leadership positions in your own respective organizations, whether as part of the student body, as part of the faculty, or many of you at work. Um, you lead and you manage. You deal with issues. And I think depending on your work, you do solicit and engage your staff, your colleagues. You do engage perspectives. But at some point, I think we also need to figure out, we need to decide where we want to go. I don't think we will ever completely have a common consensus. Yeah. I think what you would have is to make sure that hopefully the table is as clear as possible. And so climate is important. Do we trust each other sufficiently? And it's, it's, a, it's a constant exercise as you meet each other, as you engage each other uh, on different platforms, different occasions, you size each other up. I mean, that's, that's, I don't think it's unique to just government and civil society. I would suggest that it's, it's actually part of human dynamics in everything that we do. You size each other up, you establish whether are you comfortable laying your cards on the table, and hopefully we, are, we can be as open as possible to lay those cards on the table. This is how we see it. These are the issues that we, we are contending with. Those are the issues that the different stakeholders will feel. And sometimes you have multiple stakeholders with actually very different angles. And sometimes it's not us arguing with civil society. It's actually the groups themselves having quite divergent interests as well. So I, I think that at the very least, can we lay things on the table as, as clearly as we can? Can we say that it's completely unfettered, it's completely honest and open? I think, I suspect it will vary from issue to issue, groups to group, uh, it will vary with different groups. Because a lot depends on the dynamics that uh, develops. A lot will depend on the issue itself, and I think a lot will depend on the relationships established. So I don't think it can be just a functional thing you come and just discuss, but I think it's about relationship building. So if we're able to lay it on the table, then really it's just, Let's see how we can discuss what ought to be discussed. And I'll tell you that sometimes it will just go in two directions. Uh, some, for example, I will get this response that, yeah, okay, you all want to engage, right? but bluff or not, you know? We, we highlight all this and then you all didn't take it on board. But we hear, I mean, I hear the points, and one could argue that you hear, but actually you, you don't really bother and you just want to shape it according to your agenda. Or the fact, but the fact of the matter is that all of us are also in a position where we will take on board, we will listen, but at the same time, you can't accommodate every single view. I think we just have to allow that process to unfold here as honestly as we can on both ends. And ultimately, I think we need to find where the common ground is or where the common grounds are and where are the areas that we actually cannot agree on and then try to see how to, to best uh, compartmentalize it. And if we all realize that we do share a common perspective going forward, then let's at least focus on getting forward there in whatever shape and form and leave some of these things behind. Um, and you, I think that's you said, you said honestly as you can. As honestly as you can. Would you agree that that honestly as you can, that threshold varies from political leader to political leader? Well, I think it varies from individual to individual yeah. because we're all so, different. So let me ask you this question. <clears throat> I mean, I've known you for several years now, mainly in the army, right? And I, I can vouch for, for him. He's a good man. <laughs> He's a good no. man too. <laughs> no, I've seen him operate in a highly regimented organization, going against the grain and insisting on talking to people and finding out. And I'm saying this absolutely honestly. I have seen him go against the grain in a military organization and say, no, we need to hear them out. Why is it that they feel? He could have easily gone the other way and said, no, this is an instruction, this is an order, you follow it. Which is the reason why 
I think people actually do have some faith in you. I don't know. Do you all have no, faith? No, they do. They do. <laughs> I, I think there's a, at least they're willing to meet you halfway. But to be very honest, are you having to suffer the process within the leadership? No, actually, I, I would say that... Um, You're blushing even as you speak. No, no, this, <laughs> that's, that's because of the scotch that we had before <laughs> the dialogue. Um, no, I would say that actually one of the things that I found quite... You know, as with, I think, most of us, right? I mean, before getting into politics, you think that there's this whole big PAP machinery and you know, all the different dynamics think, that go... You think? You mean it's not true? Yeah, so I'm coming to it, right? <laughs> so, and... But what I've actually found quite surprising, honestly, and quite refreshing is that um, it's actually tremendously open. I'll give you some examples. I'm not a very exam smart kind of person. Right? I feel very strongly about certain issues and I don't really care. Well, okay, maybe that's not the right way to put it. But I, I don't really bother too much about some of the boundaries in place or expectations because if I'm quite clear that some things are important, uh, there are certain issues you feel strongly about. I think there is space for us to stand up for what you believe in. It doesn't matter that it may not reflect very well. You know, you, there'll be things that have done that doesn't endear me to my bosses, certainly dressing down in front of everybody else. But if there's something you believe strongly about, I think you have to make that decision to operate in a particular space. And that's something that I hope I could continue to do. And suddenly coming in, suddenly during the election period, you, could, you are campaigning. And I, there were certain things I felt very strongly that I wanted to say. You know, Remember before during elections, how you had to prepare that video to introduce yeah. yourself, and then the introduction interview, and then you'll be preparing, and then most of the time you think about what you ought to say, what people expect you to say, and then every time you, you know, sort of prepare the script, and somehow it doesn't come out right, but it's just not you. So I decided, look, I'm just going to say what I'm going to say. It's not going to be always the most politically correct thing. Um, but, well, certainly PM has not scolded me so far. Uh, suddenly there were things that I have felt strongly about, and I know that, I mean, suddenly in our various dialogues, um, suddenly Prime Minister has said to us that if you feel very strongly about something, you should just speak up, and you should just articulate your views. And in fact, I found that actually remarkably refreshing. I mean, the perception I had was that, you know, there's a lot of group thing, and perhaps there's a lot of uh, wariness to actually articulate your views, but I have not actually found that to be so. In fact, I find that even within our own political party, certainly with the MPs in our own internal dialogues, my goodness, it's actually quite bruising. Uh, quite blunt and quite, which I thought was really great to see. Um, and I think that's something important, and that, that's about climate. I think it's about climate in whatever organisations you're in, to really set in place a climate that allows people to run and to speak up. We all say, look, you should speak your mind, you know? be creative. Yeah, then the next thing you make a mistake, you get whacked. Then obviously, at the rest of the people watching, you just take the cue from it. So even though we may mean it, but it's the little things that we do that really shapes the environment. And all of us are guilty at, with it in the way we treat people, the way we talk. The little things that we say actually affects it a lot. And that is disengagement. But if you engage, meaning that you really believe that all of us have a contribution to make, and then you set a climate, and yet at the same time provide that space, and really almost bend over backwards sometimes to allow that space to grow. And for example, in the army, it would be, sometimes it would come across as, you look so indecisive. Why are you discussing back and forth? You know, just make a decision and move on. But if I don't need to make a decision, I don't need to make a decision. Let people speak up. So even at the expense of being very inefficient at meetings, even at the expense, even in the middle of operations during, uh, during the tsunami, we had a lot of discussions. But when the time came for the decide, you have to be decisive, you make the decision and you move. And you expect everyone to move. But before then, to get there, the process of dialogue and engagement, I thought was really critical because it allowed all of us to play a part in actually shaping what we wanted to do. You, you would think that in a military environment, right, you just give the orders and you follow it. I mean, that's the easiest thing to do, but to really understand why you're doing what you're doing. Because you know that in operations, things will change. You have a plan, it's never going to work exactly the way it is. It will unfold in many different ways. But if you're just following to the letter of the mission, when the circumstances change and you don't really understand it fully, I don't think you can adapt. So the participation in the process, one, you leverage on everybody's collective wisdom. Secondly, as you participate in the process, you feel a sense of pride in being part of a larger team, in being able to shape something more. And I think when things change, you can actually confidently let your leaders at whatever level improvise and move. And that actually is quite critical. So while it is slow, you actually end up being fast because you actually end up building capacities. And I think that's what engagement really is. 
And I think when individuals feel that their views are respected, that they generally can play a part. Even though your final, the final outcome may not be exactly the way you wish it to be, uh, perhaps some of your suggestions wasn't quite incorporated, but you felt that you were part of that process and you contributed in your own small way. And I think feeling involved uh, makes a lot of difference to the final outcome. I think not just the actual outcome itself, but actually the journey getting there, I think is really quite critical. And that's something I, I feel quite strongly about. Uh, can we apply that in the context of, you know, as a political office holder? Um, I, I think it's quite possible. I, I certainly think that it can be done, certainly within the ministry, certainly in the different issues. Like I said, I suspect it varies because topic to topic, uh, there will be different parameters involved. But I, I think it's something that is certainly worth pursuing. And certainly from my experience, uh, I have not felt that I've been helmed in in any particular way. So you if the space the term, is there, just run. You used the term trust 14 times at least oh, it today, this okay. evening. And, and what do you think needs to be done to build that trust? Now, one of the things, if I could, I could share with the audience here, you obviously went through a period a point at which you, where, where you felt that, that trust was actually taken for granted in your engagement with the NGOs during the Bukit Brown saga. There was one point where you wrote in the blog. Yeah, so never write blogs right. in the middle so of the morning right? when you're tired. Early in the morning, you wrote <laughs> and you, you put across your feelings quite strongly. Right? And you felt betrayed. That came through. But in my view, that built trust. When you are prepared to expose your vulnerability, it shows that you trust the other party enough to expose your vulnerability. And do you know that you're held in high, relatively high esteem by the people you actually chided? Because they felt that you opened up, you trusted them enough to show them your emotions. I thought I was just tired and no. pissed off. Maybe you should have a few whiskeys. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but, but you see, I, th I think a, an important part of trust is allowing your vulnerabilities to be shown. I think being it's, who it's, you are. I think it's about being, yeah. Uh, and like I was sharing earlier, I mean, you know, when, when I was talking about how um, preparing in terms of the uh, introduction and so on and sharing about what you believe in and all that. And, and it was something that I concluded a long time ago. So it's just, I think the simplest thing to do is just be yourself. Because yeah. I think, firstly, it's a lot less stressful. You don't really have to pretend. And you can be very consistent with that's you. So people either take, take to that or not. Um, uh, but neither should one be stupid about it. So I think you need to be circumspect. But at the same time, I think uh, it's important to be really quite true to what you believe in. And I am someone who feels quite strongly that there is a space for all of us to remain individuals. A lot of times today you hear, oh, you know, what to do, no choice, society is like that. You know? oh, the school system is like that, I've got to send my kids for tuition, no, not my fault. No. But it's a no choice kind of situation in both piano, right? But is it really so? Actually, our lives is in our own hands. The government cannot determine your happiness. I think, God forbid, the day that that, that is the case. Because we decide our own lives. We have choices. The environment matters. The, how we try to and gender and build an environment. But I would suggest that environment is built by you as well. And I think all of us have a part to play. And I think all of us exist in our particular space where we need to be actually very clear about what we believe in and actually what our values are. And I think that's, that to me is really quite critical because one of the things, and one of my responsibilities in the army and which I felt very strongly about was actually as part of the engagement process was really about developing our leaders. So I spent a lot of time with my commanders running courses with them. And a big part of that effort at every stage is to go back to basics. Actually, to revisit, actually, why do you join the army? You know, what, what's your sense of purpose? How do you reconcile that with your own perspectives in life? What, in life? what are the values you hold and how do you translate that into a leadership philosophy of sorts? And how do you try to walk that talk? Because at the end of it, whether you're prepared to stand and be who you are and to hold your ground and to communicate and to lay the cards on the table, I think a lot has got to do with self. Self gets in the way a lot. If you're worried about how you're progressing, you're worried about your career, you're worried about how your bosses 
relate to you. You worry about how the public looks at you, you know, uh, and other concerns. I think that rapidly begins to shape. And I think a lot of us are subjected to that because I think all of us will have our own vanities, our own egos, our ambitions. And I think we need to reconcile that with the things that we say that we believe in. And I think that's really important because I think sometimes we can end up actually believing in the, in the spin that we throw out, you know, about, oh, I believe in this, I believe in that, and we actually might believe in it. But actually, I always feel that the easiest person that you can bluff actually is your boss. They're the easiest people to bluff. But the people you cannot bluff are the people that are working alongside you, your colleagues and your subordinates, because they you, see the real you. Or your wife. Or my wife, or the public at large. And you know, a lot of it comes from the interaction that takes place. And, and so for me, I guess it's really something that, but it comes with practice. It's, it's not comfortable. Um, and I think we need to regularly put ourselves out and actually try to walk that talk. And I would suggest that leadership isn't just something that you're born with. I think it's something that you have to practice and you have to actually try to do it and learn to be comfortable with it. And I'll tell you that it, it gets thrown back in your face. You know, even now, I mean, it happens. Um, and it can be kind of depressing sometimes. You know, you, you put in a lot, um, a lot of hours and so on. Uh, you put in, certainly in some of the issues, really sincerely trying to reach out um, then it comes, you know, comes all the way back. There'll be individuals out there, and you have to learn to sort of take that in your stride. Um, you need to learn to, I guess, I need to learn to filter without becoming overly desensitized. Because the worst thing they can do is if you become cynical and just broad brush everything away. And then actually, that that really, I think, would not be very useful at all. Because that's when I think you begin to shut yourself out from a lot of things. So yeah, I think being exposed, I think it's important, but you need to learn to live with that vulnerability of sorts, I guess. And I guess the worst part of it is you're not paid enough. I'm not paid enough. I think it's <laughs> quite sufficient. <laughs> let's leave it. Okay. <laughs> I just needed to say that. Um, with that, let's have questions, comments, and as I usually say, no speeches. Yes, please. Yep. One, and then we'll go to two, and then Val. Okay. Hi, yes, uh, good evening, sir. I'm Yuan Chen, Year 2 Environmental Studies. So my question to you is, uh, I have two questions actually. The first, so what, what's next after uh, engagement? There will be disagreement. And would it accumulate to a point where we, as a country, hold referendum on certain issues? For example, minimum wage. Uh, that's the first question. For and example, the, sorry? A mini the issue of having a minimum wage. Okay. Yep. The second question is, uh, you talk about engagement, but I guess... Uh, before engagement, you need to have uh, accurate, transparent information. In the case of Bukit Brown, for example, the, the EIA that the government con conducted was not uh, published to the public. So I guess that the, this withhold of information would actually distort certain ideas of people have mm -hmm. regarding that issue. So going forward, do you see the government being more transparent in such issues? Thanks. By EIA, you mean environment, environment impact, impact assessment? Impact assessment. Yeah. I think going forward, um, I would think that more information would be made available and open, I think, on a range of issues. Certainly on my MOM side as well. I mean, there are data that we don't publish. Uh, we believe there are good reasons for that. Because sometimes, you know, as you track certain figures, it gets amplified, and I think um, it, can get, well, it can get quite heated up. One could argue that we should just have complete freedom uh, of information so that everyone can assess for themselves. And why should we be so paternalistic and you know, decide what can be released and what cannot be released? Um, I think it's a fair concern. I think certainly that I think some of us, and certainly I'm sure some of you would feel that way as well. But again, I would put it to you. I think many of you also lead, like I said, in your organisations. Uh, how transparent are we? Do we necessarily put out all our data? Uh, do we necessarily put out all the discussions, information that goes on behind the scenes out to all our various members for them to decide uh, for them in this spirit of complete freedom of information? Um, I think there are good reasons why sometimes we don't, and I think that remains the case. The obvious case, I'm not going to talk about the obvious cases, where about national security and so on, but anything in the realms where, in the grey area, where you, one could argue whether, actually, is that really sensitive or not? And it's a judgement call. Uh, but I would think that the trend going forward would be, I think more information would be made available than less. Uh, and I think we should look internally within certainly each ministry and so on, and to look at where are, they, where are those things that really aren't quite as sacrosanct as we think that they are and make it available so that at least it's out there. Uh, it may not be make for comfortable reading sometimes. Uh, perhaps if you track certain date, 
figures, for example, on a monthly basis, it, it may not be very useful because on a month-to-month -month basis, it doesn't really give a very useful indicator of sorts, but it can get played out. But I guess if it gets played out often enough, it, it no longer becomes an issue. People get kind of tired about it as well. So I, think, I guess we do need to open up the space uh, as to how far we, are good, we, have, we will go and so on. I think we will have to, let, we will have to see how that evolves. But your, it's a fair comment to say that if uh, information is not completely available, then obviously for the different stakeholders, it's sometimes difficult for them to assess. Uh, but I would suggest that I think in the case of, say, like, say we book it brown and some of the other issues, uh, certainly I think a lot of it is just basic logic. Um, the issues at hand aren't complicated in a sense. The impact on the environment, the impact on uh, whether you need the road, whether you don't need the road, eventually a lot of this is a judgment call. And this is where we come back to your first question, is that do you then end up with a referendum? I'm not sure, perhaps I put it to a referendum. Do you all feel that as a government, certainly on many issues, perhaps the best thing to do is to put it for a referendum and for people to decide whether you have minimum wage, whether, you know, there is a whole range of policies that we can put forward. Because as you can see today, there are many contentious views, many different views. I would suggest it's not just one view and another view, actually there are many different views. Would that be the way to go? I would put it to you this way. I, believe that it's important to have that process of dialogue and conversation so that we can sense make different views can be surfaced. But I think the responsibilities of leaders and being put in place as leaders is to be able to then sense make from all the different views out there and to make a decision. And when the time comes and you need to decide, you decide and you move with the best of intentions. There will be those who don't agree. I don't, I'll be very surprised if we have a complete agreement on every issue. But I think we need to find a way to also carry those who are not in agreement. Are they prepared to accept? Are they prepared to move along? There are certain areas which we agree on. Can we work on those areas and accept that there'll be areas that we cannot agree? I don't think we will ever reach a complete consensus, and I don't think that's the objective. The objective, I think, really is to be able to engage in as open a discourse as possible to gather the views so that you can have a sense of the different perspective but there comes a time where we need to make a decision and we need to do that. I think that it's important, I think at various levels, but I think the courage needs to be there because today there's a lot of pressure that's brought to bear. Social media amplifies it, you feel the pressure. I mean, certainly I feel the pressure from businesses. This morning I had a breakfast meeting with businesses. Um, actually, it turned out there wasn't a lot of pressure this morning, but certainly in a lot of other occasions, we're also tightening up the manpower, and you feel that. But then we also have Singaporeans who feel they're not tightening enough. You're letting in foreigners and they're competing for jobs and so on. So how do you... But you need to listen to the perspective because they are genuine for the person's concern. And then in that whole range of views out there, try to discern what the dynamics are, what the issues are. Are there blind spots that we have not quite addressed? And certainly I found that the different perspectives and certain posts that have been put on my Facebook, uh, inputs have provided to me via emails or through discussion groups and so on, we've brought them on board and taken a look and some of that has certainly has shaped the way I look at policy making, but eventually we need to decide. I'm not sure that referendum is the way to go for virtually most things. Um, certainly, I don't know whether we have had, have we had referendums before? Yes, merger. Okay, <laughs> so we had. Um, but I don't believe that that's the way to operate. I think governments are put in place. You elect a government, you elect your leaders to help you decide, or rather to decide on your behalf. Their job, I think is to be as open as possible, to take in all the different inputs, including the inputs from the people, and then to make a call. And if we do not believe that they're making the right calls, and that's where the elections come, and we exercise the democratic process, and we choose someone else who we think can better represent us. But this leadership action takes place at, I would suggest, not just at the political level, actually at every level. And all of you exercise that in your own way as well. And I would suggest that many of you, nor do you carry out referendum in all the issues that you manage. Sometimes you'll be making decisions which aren't always the most popular, but that's not what we are here to do. And I think it would be kind of a scary thought if a government is just making a decision because that's a popular thing to do. I think we need to make a decision because we honestly believe that that's the right thing to do for our people and for society at large. Okay, good. Yes. We'll come to you later. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Tan Ping, graduate of the University of Malaya. I just want to comment whether the, we are now suffering from the efficiency of the PAP government. It used to be people, anything that crops up, let the government decide, let them decide. So 
everything will be ultimately left to the government to decide. So I was thinking whether, although it is the ultimate responsibility of the government to make the decision, whether your thinking process should be multiplied elsewhere with all the NGOs and the think tanks who can also think up on the same subject and properly, as you say, engage them to find out what their thinkings are. Therefore, can you see more and more people with this NGO the, who fight for foreign labor and so on, for uh, anti-dumping uh, or whatever you call it, and also the think tank in this university here and NTU and elsewhere. So do you think the government should encourage them to have this sort of uh, en engagement? Yeah, Thank so you. Ju just to understand you better, what you're saying is instead of engaging the man on the street, uh, it may be more productive to engage organizations with some level yeah. of expertise, experience, competency. Is that what you're saying? Yes, otherwise you waste your labor. Like, like no. professional bodies, yeah. alumni, yeah. organizations, yeah. and so on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think that's a fair comment. Uh, and certainly, I think this is where I always use the idea of, uh, you know, if you, you look at what's the function of government, there are things that we can do, but are there things that actually can be done by somebody else? Uh, whether better or not, I think there are certain there are areas where you know that nobody else does this job, and you better make sure that you do that job. Because you know, in, in terms of governance, there will be certain things that actually no other players, no other stakeholders can do those parts. And you must make sure that those parts are done by you. But there will be areas that might overlap with different, with different groups. For example, you mentioned about NGOs, you mentioned about think tanks. I would suggest that you could even talk about uh, areas of business. Some would argue that actually whether, for example, public transport I thought you all should just keep you know, public transport and manage that rather than divest it and run it separately. Because I think those, those are areas where we sometimes feel that perhaps it's better run on a commercial basis and you either turn it into a stat board or you commercialize it and privatize it and let it run on that basis as opposed to running it centrally. So I think that form of divestment of sorts takes place. So there is a question of degree and in areas. Um, do we then farm out policy making space I would suggest that in the area of, um, say, the social welfare services, certainly with uh, MCYS or MSF uh, today, uh, they work with a lot of VWOs. They fund a lot of the VWOs. But I think that's where the VWOs have very um, sharp feel of the ground in the areas that they deal with. And actually, it's better for the VWOs themselves to be the ones that actually disburses some of this help in a very focused and specific ways. And then at the government level, to really formulate some of the policies, funding, guidance, but allow that space for some of these uh, VWOs to run. And I think that's the kind of model that you can probably look at at the different areas. But I think neither could government actually divest full responsibility. I think certainly in terms of the key policy making decisions, I think it's for government to decide. That's what the people elect the government to do. But what you can do is to leverage on the collective wisdom that's out there. I would say that whether is it very different uh, from say our independent days, um, I think society is different. Not that people didn't care, but I think we had a lot of different preoccupations at that stage. Um, level of exposure was very different. The amount of information available was, of course, very different as well. Certainly, the internet has made a tremendous amount of difference. Educational level has gone up significantly. The way I think education is unfolding, certainly in schools, a lot of us are taught to be critical thinking, to question. So society is different. So society is in a place where it can actually participate and play and wants to play. So how do we provide that space, whether for think tanks, NGOs, and focus groups, and allow them to also participate and share their views? I think that's something we can do more of. And certainly to provide an alternative perspective. So you don't want to just have a group think. So you want to leverage on as many different views as you can, and for them to contribute recommendations. But, 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 so, but you ultimately, think, you need to decide yeah. how best to formulate those you policies. Think, uh, do you think, picking up from this point, do you think that there, is a, there might be a problem of too much of engagement. Yes, there can be. You know, there's just a lot of engagement. I mean, I'm hearing, I'm reading about it every day. Are we, are we doing it? And, and when, when there's too much of something, people start doubting the integrity, people start doubting the intent behind it. Uh, do you think there's a risk no, of In fact, some will question that why are you wasting time doing yeah. all this? I mean, there are why? people who question if, me if about you, why are you engaging you know some of these groups on these issues. You should just decide and move on, there are far more important issues that you should yeah. be grappling with. So um, there's so a there, sense yes, there on is, the ground there that is. there's a lot of churn, there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of engagement. Well, my, my honest opinion, I mean, so far, do you think there's too looking much at it, 
um, certainly on my part, and engaging in the different uh, outreach activities that we have been doing, um, I, I don't particularly regret those mm -hmm. activities, uh, certainly those engagement with different groups. Um, I think it's useful for me and my colleagues in the ministries to learn how better to engage, how to engage better, uh, how the next time round, you know, perhaps you can be more focused, can be sharper, perhaps you could do more or perhaps you could do less. And I say it really depends on the topic and the issue itself. Uh, I, I would agree that you can over-engage. Uh, for example, I would say that this is where there's a timeline, right? There's a point at which decisions need to be made and there's a point at which decisions don't need to be made. In that space in between, then does it allow you to actually take on board the different views? There's a cost. It is not cost-free. It takes up bandwidth from our offices. It takes up time. And I would suggest that today a lot of engagement takes place even just simply by all the emails that are being sent, whether spurious or otherwise. We have to service all the different, like HDB services, 30, 40,000 appeals every month. Some genuine, some not, you know. Um, but you, you don't know at first glance. But we don't realize that it costs time and effort. It also costs the people's time and effort. It does, certainly. And certainly it also takes up energy where you have finite number of hours a day. Yeah. You know, there's only that many brain cells you can operate, I suppose. You try to multitask as best you can. But there are many, many other issues that we are grappling with at the same time. And not all of them are visible. Not all of them are necessary in the public domain space. Some of them actually are very critical, but actually, you know, when you it's very instructive when you put things out on the Facebook. Some of the very critical issues, actually you don't get many people responding and so on, but actually people respond to some other perspectives. But those efforts still need to go, you still need to, you know, those, those works still need to, you still need to go, on, go on. So you need to eventually decide how much you do and how much perhaps you should, uh, or where you pull back. Um, but I think it's something we are learning in the process as well. Uh, and you're right, there can be over-engagement, too much engagement, because I think at the end of it, you also look, let, enough talking, let's do something and move on with it. Uh, but there'll be certain occasions where perhaps it's better to just talk and let it unfold. And I think it will vary, but I think both from a governance perspective and certainly I think from a society perspective, I think we are all in this process of trying to figure out where that so-called new norm is. Yeah. Um, and I suspect it's a very dynamic space. I don't think it's going to remain static, but I think that will be an ongoing process. Val, you want to... Let's, let's, uh, how many more minutes do we have? 15 minutes or so. so. Uh, may I suggest that we keep it going a little faster? Um, so quick question, comments, and then we move on. Uh, sorry, maybe we'll get the gentleman who's been standing up for some time uh, first. Well, you don't mind? Yes. Evening, Minister. Um, former CEO, sir. Um, yeah. Former CEO, sir. Third the guards, 10th. Third yeah, yeah. guards. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I, I have well two points to make. Oh, first is a more concrete issue: um, how we um, how we should help people who are currently buying HDB flats, maybe 10, 20 years down the road, because right now flat, flat prices are very expensive. And if we look at demographic trends, the property buying ban, the people aged 30 to 49, that number will decrease to 91% of its current level in 10 years. 81% of its current level in 20 years. So you have declining demand, and well, that, that leads to bubble bu um, property bubbles, bu bubbles bursting like in Japan. And also, people who are buying in Pongol, they have nowhere to downgrade to. So these people are really faced with capital losses as opposed to capital gains. How, how do you think we can actually help them? And the second point is, sorry, well, sorry. maybe just to clarify, what, what capital, what how are they losing their capital gains? Um, yeah, because you are actually have facing declining demand. Now prices are high, there's declining demand. It's more likely that they lose, that prices go down and continue going up based on demographics. Okay, yeah. may, and, may, I, may, yeah. may I suggest this? Yeah. Let's try and avoid very yeah. port, portfolio specific questions. Yeah. Well, the other uh, one is today. a bit more general. Yeah. Perhaps. Um, yeah. I'm actually a member of the SDP and we launched this policy paper. and. And the thing is that when the opposition launches um, some policy plans and tries to engage ministries, they don't actually, there's no real engagement. And perhaps the problem is because maybe the opposition is posturing and the PAP is also posturing and can't, can't really meet halfway. So do you think there's scope for actually, actually having closed door meetings where there's actually no posturing? As, and as you actually said, it, within the PAP there's sort of brutal discussion. 
can we actually have that in the um, um, in politics in Singapore? So yours is a political question, I suppose. But, but closed yeah. door, right? Yeah, closed so door. May, may I suggest this? Um, can we can we drop the first question? It's very technical. Okay. The second question, I think, is relevant. Yep. Let's see whether the well, I think is comfortable um, in addressing that. I think it's that. important because yeah. it's useful for us to know where you're coming from, which yeah. is why the slant of your question. So because you're making certain statements and allegations about where you think prices will be, as if that's a matter of fact, I think it's disputable. You claim that public housing is necessarily more expensive. I think we should go on the HDB info web and look at the range of HDB flats available. I think for those who are just looking at mature estate resale, I think the resale prices are high. But I think if you look at non-mature estates, and I think if you look at the two-room, three-room, four-room flats, and you look at the prices, is it more than it was five, ten years ago? Yes, it was. Yes, it is. But I think if you look at the combined income levels that are eligible to buy, and we've, for in most cases, buying whether it's a three-room, four-room, or five-room flat, for those combined income, because I, we look at the actual income levels, most of them actually are able to service it without necessarily a huge amount of cash outlay, if at all. But it's whether are you buying within that income bracket that you would be comfortable with, or are you overstretching and buying something more, or you want to buy a matured estate where obviously it costs a bit more than others. So I think, it's, I think that's important. Um, as to whether in terms of engagement of different political parties, I think when the, on the political side of the House, certainly SDP put forward your housing plan. I think MND has taken on board. We've, thanked, uh, we've I think, responded to the SDP who had written in. I think we will take on board the inputs. Uh, but the inputs are not new. I think a lot of this, some of these schemes, uh, when HDB started, some of these uh, formulations were in place. In fact, I think one of my recent visits to Hong Kong, here Hong Kong has a lot of very different uh, housing schemes and uh, methodologies. I think um, the, and many Singaporeans actually have written in on variations on these ideas as well. I mean, the ideas in itself are fine. The challenge is actually translating ideas into reality. How do you actually translate it into something that's practical? At the end of it, can it be fair? Can it be equitable? How do you distribute scarce resource and to make sure that it's allocated in a fair uh, manner? And I think that's something that we are looking at, whether the current model uh, can be re-looked at, whether can there be different um, sales model, for example, as proposed uh, by the SDP. Uh, that's something internally we are looking at as well. But I think the challenge right now is how do you actually translate that into something that's actually workable, uh, that will be consistent with uh, what expectations are, and how do you make sure that public housing remains supportable? I mean, let, let's, put it, let's, let's be quite clear about this. Singapore provides public housing for 80 over 90% of the population. I think there are very few countries that actually would endeavour to do that. In fact, if we are so unhappy with HDB, we should just close HDB down. We should just provide HDB housing for the bottom 10, 15%. That's what most countries do. But we actually believe that it's important. Housing isn't just a physical space. I think it's about us emotively establishing a place where we can call a home, where we can build a home. And we want to make sure that it's affordable, which is why I think public housing remains sacrosanct. It's something that's important, and it's something that we do want to provide for as many Singaporeans as possible, so in terms of managing the cost. And that's something that we watch closely in terms of the income levels and so on. So that's something we will track, and we do intend to make sure that HDB housing remains affordable. But whether individuals choose to buy something more, buy in choice locations and all that, that's a slightly different matter. I meet a lot of residents every week who are appealing but when I look at the profile and look at what they are asking for and look at what's available, I think that's a slight mismatch there as well. But individuals have to exercise their choice. So I would say that, I mean, we take on board the different perspectives. We'll send it in. I think we will look at it. Well, you can take it offline after this. Yeah, yeah if you want. Right. Uh, well, these guys are really sabotaging you. Huh? They're standing up, making me feel bad. Okay, never mind, never mind. Since you stood up, huh? but no more standing up, okay? All right, yes. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sinjin. Um, Can like you speak to... up a little bit, please? Sure, my name is Sinjin. I'd like to pass a couple of comments before my question. Oh. Okay. So, Can you make them quick? Short yeah, I'll comments? make it quick. I'll make it. I've written down. Okay, so firstly, a quick thing um, about population. It's well known that Singapore has a low total fertility rate and... Mr. MMD himself has said Singapore's population is shrinking possibly up to 20% in the coming years. That's number one. So I fully appreciate our foreign, our government getting foreign people in, foreign talents, engaging them to not just make up for the fall in the Singaporean's population, but in fact to increase the overall population. So it's not just making up for the fall, but increase. So I fully appreciate it because it's a beneficial mutually and without which we can't have growth. 
And it's also a form of population selection where the increase in population are selected groups where, which can enhance the future of Singapore. So that's number one. It's just a comment. Second thing, I fully appreciate Mr. Tan's um, um, deed to try to engage us. He mentioned the need for engagement as leaders, for connection, to discuss with the people. We need to build trust, sincerely reach out to people, and we, it's important how we treat people and to engage the collect, collective wisdom of the rest. So one of the, my concerns is when we reach out and try to engage people do we do, and try to reach a consensus, do we do so with a foregone conclusion where we reach consensus around it? Or do we try to reach consensus before we come to a conclusion? So that, that comes to my main question. Hey, it's back to the same thing, the first question that you raised, which is Bukit Brown. I'm sorry, I'll just try to make it quick, but it's important for me because for some people who have not known Bukit Brown, it forms a significant part of a, a population of Singapore. It's where we go for Qing every year. I'm 38 years old. I've gone there for more than 30 years of my life. I didn't start going to Bukit Brown just because it start, they want to build a road through it. So before I have to exhume my, my ancestors, I want to make sure that I've done what I can to make sure that things are all explored. It's an important link. It's a physical link from the present and the past. It's history, it's culture, it's for a significant part of us. For people who say, Qingming, you just go there once a year. But many things are once a year. Christmas is once a year, New Year is once a year. Many festivals are once a year. Does it diminish, in fact, just that it's once a year? Does it diminish our link to the past just because we go there once a year? We pray every day at home and we go there to offer us. I mean, we go for pilgrimage. Pilgrimage, you don't go there every time, every time a year. So it doesn't diminish the fact that it's just once a year. And if you, for people who say it's a small group of people trying to fight for them, past. But if we were to say, why not consider a cheaper alternative of extending the road to SICC or into the neighboring Macritchie Reservoir? Similarly, there'll be SICC members who will come out and say, we are the small group of people, we don't want you to encroach on our space. So as a saving grace, I mean, this happened sometime earlier this year. PMD came out and said, there are no sacred cows. But of course, we said, we are not out there to kill sacred cows. But what they are like to bring forward is, given what I mentioned as the first comment, Sorry. Singapore's so population... No response to what you said. No <laughs> okay. Given what we've mentioned in my first comment, Singaporeans' population is shrinking. Singaporeans' population is shrinking. We are trying to increase public transport. So when we build this road through our the ancestors, our, the ancestors of so many people, people who have come here to build Singapore up, they may not have the benefit of dying okay. gloriously. We, we get your point. Yeah. We okay, get so your point. My no, final thing no, no, no. is... I just sorry, sorry. Last you thing you can take it offline. Okay. You'll have to stop here. I think you've made your point. You, quite a substantive okay. point. Just one last thing. No, just I, can't, I can't let you go through. Sorry, okay. in the interest of time. Sure. Okay? I think you've made your point. Okay. Let the minister respond to the point. Okay. You can take it offline afterwards because there are a few other hands. Understand. And let's go with that. So okay? I just need to be fair. Because okay, as I said, you. we have just a few more minutes. Yeah. It's right? a thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a permanent damage. It's not reversible. We understand. Thank you. We understand your perspective. I think if we had a choice, if you ask me, would I would I like to preserve it? Yes, I would. If I could. But there's a very big difference. You see, we compare ourselves to many other cities and so on. But I'll say that there's we are very different. I mean we say it very often and we often take it for granted. Singapore is both a city and a nation at the same time. I have we started off, I think, probably in the colonial days, 590, 80 square kilometers. We reclamation over time. We have now slightly over 700 plus square kilometers. <coughs> That's all we have. Within that space, we need to decide where to live. We need to live, decide where to work. We need to decide where to play. We need to decide what part of the environment that we need to protect. You, in one breath, talk about building a road through McRitchie Reservoir. Well, I mean, for those of you, and see Peter there, who are nature enthusiasts, I think they will have a very different perspective about building a road through our central catchment. I think those things are precious and we have designated it as a nature reserve and there's a good reason why I think we do not want to go down that path. So we need to make choices and heritage and history, which I per personally feel very strongly about and I, I do fully subscribe to what you're saying. But, but we have to choose. Right? I mean, those of you who play Sim City, you know right, you've got to decide, you know, well, build this, build that, then you've got your budget. Uh, I mean, that's... That's a computer game, but that's very much real life as well. We make choices every day with the finite resources that we have. So what choices, therefore, do we make? And I'll tell you, I don't, I don't particularly enjoy making this, these decisions. 
because I value that, and I'll tell you honestly, I do feel it. You ask me what are those areas that we lament, I think we have a lot of different parts of Singapore that we all feel attached to. I used to work in the National Library every summer, uh, not summer holiday, but school holidays. So I have very fond memories of National Library. And for the life of me, I can't really understand that tunnel that's there. The okay, original but never mind. The original National, National Library. Brass Bursa. I'm not that young. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So, <laughs> but, you know, so we all have our areas which, which we feel strongly about. But I'll tell you honestly that working at URA, certainly on this front, I have a lot of very passionate colleagues who care a great deal about our heritage and history. And we actively try to preserve as much as we can. We have 7,000 over buildings preserved. And I tell you, not a lot of Singaporeans go there. Some will say, oh, it's good enough that I know it's there. But actually, if we, it's, it's the heart and soul of Singapore tied up in one place. I just recently received a petition about Sungai Road. Oh, this is the heart and spirit of Singapore. So there are many heart and spirits in Singapore. And there's a lot of green lungs that are popping up all over the place. Because somehow, you know, you live there and then there's this nice green patch. And we would all love our green patches, right? But suddenly, because of development, suddenly, you know, there'll be birds that are found there, butterflies. In fact, every corner you dig, there'll be an ecosystem that's there. I mean, that, that's a reality, but so I'm not trying to trivialize it. I think it's very important. In fact, I think there's a lot more that we can do and should do about history and heritage. Things that we can preserve, we should preserve, but bring it and make it alive as much as possible. I actually feel very strongly that we don't have enough people actually going to the many places that we actually preserve. I run around Singapore quite a lot. I'm making a point now to actually run all the different areas, certainly from my office in MOM running through uh, the Riverside and so on. And actually, you observe and you pay attention. There's a lot of what we have preserve in prime estate. One of the arguments is, oh, you all just want to make money. You don't want to develop. If we want to make money, there are a lot of areas in Chinatown and all that we will not preserve because those are prime areas. So there are areas, there are things that we can preserve and we should, and we'll continue to endeavor to struggle and try to do that. But there are times where we need to make those calls. And I don't think it's a very pleasant call either, but it's a, it's a balance that you need to make. And this will be one area that we have to agree to disagree on. So the road is going to be built. But what else can we do? So I feel very strongly about this, and suddenly, so we are funding the effort to at least document it as much as possible. So there'll be a very extensive documentation, I think never done on this scale before, certainly of uh, local Chinese cemeteries. And the space in between now and the future development, a bulk of Bukit Brown is left there. What are we going to do with that space in the interim? What are we going to do in future if we do need to develop a housing estate there? Can we develop it sensitively so I can preserve some of these elements? Can I, are, are we, are we can we be not so pantang and then I can shift some of these valuable tombstones to some of our parks, park connectors and so on? But I'm not sure every Singaporean necessarily feel that way. So we got to figure out what we could do on that front. And that really are the issues that we grapple with. Singapore needs to contend with these things. At the same time, we grapple with, we need reservoirs because water remains a vulnerability. We need to look after our own security and defence. As a result, air bases. And around every air base, you draw a rough circle I cannot build up my HDB flats because of safety. In case any emergency happens to the aircraft, there's a safety zone. But if I were Hong Kong, my industrial assist is Shenzhen. I don't even need the military. The PLA is there to defend me. In New York, I don't need a military air base right in the middle of New York, upstate New York, in Jersey, elsewhere. We don't have those choices. But what, and I'll tell you this, and certainly one of the things that I've learned I think working with N Parks and certainly working with a lot of our naturalists is despite everything, the amount of, for example, from an environment perspective, the amount of biodiversity that we have within an urbanized city like ours is actually quite remarkable. There are certain things that we are getting it right, and we need to understand what are the things that we're getting it right. When, you know, Bukit Brown, sometimes we talk about it as, oh, this is natural, and, you know, how can you tear it down? It's a cemetery, it's man made. It has, it's overgrown over the years because we left it as such. Nature reclaims its own in remarkable ways. If we need to develop it, but the fact is, we are also growing other areas, we're restoring other areas, the areas that we're preserving. Eventually, your park connectors, as it matures, as your other parks are developed, at some stage, the botanic gardens, the, the original botanic gardens, was built, was established, was cultivated. But over the years, it's taken a life of its own. It's built up an ecosystem of its own. And in time, I think we will develop some of these. So whether it's history and environment, I think we do need to pay attention to it. And I would suggest that actually from day one, we have actually been quite conscious about it. And I think going forward, you will find the pressures will increase. But that's something that I think we need to grapple with. I, I wish we didn't have to, but it's something that we have to manage and we have to find out what's the best way to balance all the different needs. Minister, would you agree very quickly that it's actually very heartening to find people grouping themselves, mm -hmm. feeling strongly enough about about issues to lobby. 
The yes. word lobby has been a bad word in Singapore for a long time. Mm -hmm. But it's a good thing because if you talk about rootedness, we need more individuals like, uh, where's the gentleman? Where is he? Ah, oh, sorry, I didn't see, okay. You know, we, we need gentlemen like this. I mean, regardless of whether the what the minister shares is completely agreeable, the fact is the minister did give his perspectives with due respect to yours. But you have the opportunity and I respect you for standing up there. I wish I could give you more time, but I respect you. And this is what rootedness is about. In fact, I would say that my lament is there are not enough people like you. Yeah. I think a lot of us should understand actually what's going on, what's there in Bukit Brown. Who care enough. It actually makes it a lot more difficult for us. I mean, one of the things I think, was thinking about as to develop is how to actually promote it a lot more, help Singaporeans understand it. But what it does mean is that when we finally need to develop it fully, actually it becomes a lot more contentious. And it's, a lot it's, more people, it's inconvenient. It's inconvenient, but, it is a necessary but I, I think journey, it's much right? better that we have it that way than not. I, I would actually rather be more distressed if there's a lot more apathy and people don't care about what our forefathers did here, what they established. So how do we bring that on board? But what it would mean is that actually it's going to make it a lot more difficult for government. Because obviously when the tensions arise and you need to make those calls, actually you're better off having an apathetic population. You don't really care, you know? so just carry on or tear down whatever, it doesn't matter. But actually I think that's actually quite sad if that happens. So while it makes it uncomfortable, and not it can be uncomfortable, but I think it's actually probably positive that it, it develops that way. But the question is, what is that discourse that takes place? How do we converse? I think the way, it's not just about where we find areas of agreement. I think the way we disagree will define us as a society. I think that's really important. Today, there's a lot of you know, flaming and all sorts of things that takes place. But I think eventually we need to find a way that we can actually discuss civilly, constructively, as best as we can, really find those common spaces, find those areas that we really cannot agree and we you know, hate ourselves to bits, fine, it's okay. But at least let's work and build something. It's not perfect but at least we are building something towards a certain direction and we see how things evolve over time. No, but, but Minister, just a quick point. Civil society doesn't necessarily always act civil. In fact, it'll be very odd if civil society acts civil all the time because it's a bit of a misnomer, isn't it? Civil society comprises people who actually feel strongly yep. about issues and sometimes when you feel strongly about issues, you may not want to pull your punches. And I think government should also maybe take that as part of the package and not judge individuals no, I think just it is. because of the way they articulate yeah. no, I would agree. I would right? agree. I think so it's part um, of engagement. I think that's, that's a fair point. And yeah. I think, and certainly in my ex short experience so far, certainly there's a wide variety yeah. of perspectives and approach. Um, but you have to take it on board. Like I said, I think it's probably a good sign yeah. that people are passionate about it, but does it mean that it becomes uncomfortable? It will be uncomfortable. In fact, you have to accept that it will be uncomfortable. In fact, it would be very odd if you become very comfortable with the process. Then there's actually very little tension in tension. place. Okay, final comment. And then the rest of you, don't worry, the minister's not going to go away. He's, he's staying overnight. <laughs> uh, we're, going to, we're going to take a break after this and then um, you know, he's going to hang around for a short while. He'll be happy to talk to some of you who feel strongly. Uh, he's brought his name cards, yes? No, no. he didn't. Okay, <laughs> yes, Val. Hi. Hello? Okay. Um, my name is Valerie, and for those of you, if it's your first time at UAL Live, um, while everything is going on here in the auditorium, we have a live feed that goes up on our website and a chat that goes along at the same time. So we've got a question here from a user named Nadine Ko, and she's a year four student um, and a geography major at NUS. Okay? And she is actually doing a study on youth politics and engagement in Singapore youth politics, okay? And she feels, and when she says youth politics, she means people below the age of 21, okay? And she feels that much of the engagement that the government is doing feels very much targeted at adults, people above the age of 21. And so she asks, um, is politics a game that youths should participate in? How and why should they do so given that they're usually seen as being too young for politics? And she also asks, given that the majority of the youth population are politically apathetic, do you see the need to reach out to these youths to get them interested in politics now? And if so, how do you propose we do so? I think a lot depends on how you define politics. Um, <clears throat> no, actually, I would, I would say that actually it's very important for even young people, certainly students, to be involved in understanding the issues that 
society is facing. Um, there are a range of issues that we, uh, we contend with, whether on the welfare front, whether on the social issues, uh, whether on economic issues, political issues. I think it's important for us to have a perspective and a frame and to develop over time an understanding of that. Um, whether through the education process, and certainly through, in terms of dialogue, I would say that it's not actually confined to just adults. In fact, I think many of us on occasions, we will visit schools and we have discussions with students. In fact, I would say that I think the most heated discussion I've had was at ACSI when I went back to my alma mater and uh, quite a heated discussion with the students. Uh, but I think it's important because we are all at a stage where we are absorbing. And I would suggest that today, young people are absorbing at a remarkable rate because it's a very unfettered world out there on the internet. And I would suggest that actually young people are absorbing from a very, very young age in a very unfettered fashion. Largely, maybe because of absentee parenting, parents are not there to guide. In fact, those of you who are parents who know the easiest thing to do, give your kid a computer and then they'll keep quiet and don't disturb you. But there's an impact. They are just absorbing. It's very unlike the past where you grew up in the confines of a family, you're being guided by your loved ones in school, your religious organizations, you develop your values, your spirit of discernment, and then you go out into the world and you decide. But today at a very young age, you're absorbing all this. What are you absorbing? Whose views are you absorbing? So I think it's important as part of the education process, both parents, who I believe are the most important educators, so we cannot absorb that responsibility. And schools playing a part to try to educate and to share some of these issues in a very practical, uh, digestible way at the different age groups. So for Singaporeans to begin to try to grapple with some of the dilemmas and issues that we have and to develop a view of your own. And that framework is important because a lot of times, whether Bukit Brown, uh, whatever issue it may be, we zoom in on one issue and we fight on that issue. But actually, these issues don't exist in isolation. They exist in a context. And that context is Singapore at large. And that context has got to do with history, has got to do with our social makeup. It's also got to do with the world because we are very much plugged in. What happens across the world, in the globe, in the region, has an impact on us. There are certain realities which I think some of us believe has an impact on the way we have to operate as a country. We may not like it, but that's a reality. But that framework is important. And I think this applies not to just young people, but actually all of us to have a sense of what our version of that Singapore framework is and that Singapore framework in the context of the world in which we live in. And then in that context, where do all our different pet topics, where do they exist? Why do they exist in that way? And then when we fight those issues, we understand the context and begin to argue on that basis rather than just a particular issue on its own. So I would say that, yes, indeed, I think it's very important to reach out to our young people as well, um, as best as we can. I think MOE is also looking at different ways to... But it's very tough on MOE. Everybody also looks at the school to really try to uh, put in place. All, as it is, I think the curriculum is very tight. Um, so what do we try to put in to sort of uh, level up that broader education in terms of understanding Singapore as a whole, I think they're looking at it as well. But I would suggest that it's something that uh, certainly media plays a part, certainly parents play a part. And I think certainly on our part, reaching out to the different groups, we will reach out, I think, to all age groups. Certainly students are important to at least help them start that process of discerning for themselves their own perspective of what Singapore means to them. Okay. That's probably a good way to, good point to <coughs> end this discussion. And I'm sure uh, you'd agree with me that being a minister, um, acting or otherwise, at this point in time, it's not easy. Really, it's, it's not easy because it takes, it takes a lot out of you to be able to sit in front or stand in front of a large group of people uh, with stronger convictions, you know, and not come across upset. It takes a lot. I'm not sure whether you have had the opportunity to do that, but uh, it's not easy. And to be, to be forced to do that, hitting the road running, uh, is, is laudable. And Perhaps if I can just close, just yeah, to share, yeah. just maybe a parting point. Um, I think we are, you know, we use the topic of engagement, a point which I touched on earlier, it, it's really two ways. It is not just, okay, come on, you engage me, so let's, let's see what you all can do. At the end of it, I think all of us are here as Singaporeans. I think there is something that we are trying to do. And I would suggest that at the heart of it all, it's not your economic growth, it's not the, the physical things are important. I mean, they may not sound the most aspirational, but they're functional things that, you know, as with all homes, we need to manage our budget and all that. 
but you are really trying to build a home. It's not just a physical space. And a home has got to do with memories, history, heritage, a sense of place, a sense of where we came from, a sense of who we are, which is very much shaped by our history and circumstance. A home is also established because of relationships, the engagement between people, not just people and government, but between people in society. It starts off with strong family units, because that's what gives your house, that's what makes it a home because of love, relationship. And what makes your community a home to you is because you know your neighbours. A lot of us are very inward focused. You know, we live in a block of flats. You actually see the guy for the longest time, but actually you don't know him. You know, uh, dripping laundry, you know, idiot, you know, and whatever. But you know that guy, suddenly it's, it's very different. But do we try to actually reach out and get to know people? Do we reach out and give back to society? So at the end of it, really, I would suggest is that I think all of us have a stake in this. We cannot just look at, in fact, the gentleman, you know, the government is doing everything. I, the government cannot do everything. In fact, I think sometimes the government should do less in some things. You know? um, but I think we try to do what we can, but certainly we can't do it alone. And certainly building a society cannot be built by government. You cannot mandate these are our values and therefore, it, no, it can't be. And I mean, you know, I was involved in doing National Day and I think I remember having a quite an in-depth discussion with Viswa on our pledge. Yep. I felt very strongly that I was not organizing a parade. It's not an event. It is probably the most important day for a Singaporean. It's the day we became independent. What does it mean? And we were looking at a focal point and we used a pledge because that's something that we're all familiar with. What are we pledging ourselves to? And we discussed at length, I asked Viswa to end. In fact, I was watching it unfold. When in his maiden speech, I think you talked, you tabled the whole, the whole issue and it sparked off, but that's exactly what you want. You want, we need to think for ourselves. You cannot tell people what it means. We cannot tell you what the pledge means. I cannot tell you why you should be proud to be Singaporean. I can tell you why I'm proud to be Singaporean. But ultimately, all of us must exercise our choice. Because if we don't make those choices, then actually we're just letting things slip us by. Then things will evolve in a way of its own. We can blame society, we can talk about how things are you know, so materialistic, why are we not? But then, we are the same people talking about it. We are society. If each and every one of us here choose to exercise our right to live the life that we choose, to exercise the values, and to fight for something we believe for, and to shape society in a way which we feel society ought to be shaped, then society will change. It's as simple as that. It is not rocket science. Do you believe that you can make a difference? Don't just think about the big difference. Because actually, when you break it down into small, bite-sized chunks, it starts from the family, it starts with the neighbours, floor by floor, block by block, and you begin to build something. As you give back to society, you reach out and help others, you begin to care for others, and you begin to appreciate what you have. And you begin to realise how you can contribute and make a difference to the people around you at work. And as you live and work in a space where people actually care for each other, and that's where a society evolves. And that's where a home is built. And you look beyond just the confines of the material, your pay, the career, and everything else, which is important. But really, at the end of our lives, when you look back, those will not be the things that we will be lauding about. It will be about the people that means a lot to us, about the differences that we make, the lives that we touch. And that is at the heart of what we are trying to do. Whether government, people, NGOs, we all have a stake here. Singapore born otherwise, I think being here, I think that's something that we can bring to the table. The question is, are we prepared to do that? Or do we just say what to do? You know, let's wait for the government or criticise or tear things down. Build something. And I think if all of us actually do what we can do, society will change. And at the heart of it, we're trying to build a great nation. We're trying to build a great home. And it is not impossible. There is no reason why the negativity that we see online and so on has to be reality. It is not as long as we step forward and exercise our right as individuals to live the life and to shape the society that we believe ought to be, you know, in the shape and form that it should be. And I think that's where we begin to build a Singapore that all of us can be proud of. And I think that's really what we're all about. Not just myself, all of you here, all of us. And I think that's something that all of us can do. Thank you. <clears throat> Even though, even though he made the mistake of going to ACS.
I, was I must say, I was in RJ for two years. Yeah, so you re <laughs> redeemed <laughs> yourself. <laughs> but I must say that um, you must continue to believe in engagement, even if your brick bats continue to come towards you. It'll still come. It, you, there's no room for cynicism, and we wish you all the best. And we're proud to have you as an alumni. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we've got something, a small token of appreciation of the two of us sitting here. Yeah. There's a picture taken just now. Thank you. Well, you stole the picture. Yeah. They're copyrighted, no, not just the pictures. The other of pictures. course. <laughs> They're copyrighted, huh? It doesn't matter. It's part of Singapore anyway. Well, no. <laughs> and here, uh, we'd like you to write something nice about your experience tonight. <laughs> I was told that this would be read out, so I need to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> like, right? um, no Hokkien bad words, please. Yeah. I reserve that for tomorrow morning. <laughs> oh, tomorrow when we morning, go back yeah, to the yeah. army. Um, okay, you want to read it? Yeah, okay. Well, it says, uh, let us all build a home we can be proud of and that we love. And there'll be? And there'll be love. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Keep the idealism. Shall we? Please join us for reception.